Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Kara Manis and we are so excited to have you all here today at our webinar. Um, we are going to kick things off as we are two o'clock Eastern on the dot. Um, we are here to talk about the five hacks for effective studying in an online environment. We know you guys are dealing with a lot of transition. A lot of things have really changed this semester for you guys. So we have a really fantastic hour with two uh, really knowledgeable panelists here to talk to you guys about some tips and hacks to help you get through the semester successfully. So before I turn it over, I do want to do a quick introduction as we have two really fantastic panelists like I spoke about. Lisa Heller Borgini um, is an associate professor of communication and an adjunct instructor at Cape Cod Community College and Bridgewater State and Stonehill College. She's very, very busy. Yeah. Uh, yes, she, she teaches a lot of different courses, everything from interpersonal communication, public speaking, human, human communication, college success, uh, debate, all sorts of different things. So she's here to talk about some tools and things that you can use to, to do better this semester. And then we also have Anya. Anya is here um, and she is a student at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And Anya's in her third year. She's an econ major and a math minor. And I'll let her speak about it, but I think she is fully online this semester. So she definitely has, has some things that she would like to share with you guys um, and, and best practices to get you guys to this semester. So just a couple of housekeeping things. We do have a chat. You are more than welcome to go ahead and, and chat and ask questions. We also have a Q&A button that you're more than welcome to use as well if you have a question that you wanna submit for Professor B or Anya. Um, but I will let you guys know, we, we will at the end, we will have a Q&A uh, session. So we'll go ahead and try to pull some of those questions towards the end. So if we don't answer them you know, right, right now, just know that we will get to them hopefully if we have lots of extra time here at the end. So if you haven't already, go ahead and let us know where you're calling in from in the chat. Uh, it's so fun to see you guys all joining. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Professor B to kick us off today. So go ahead. Great, thanks so much, Kara. It is so nice to see everyone virtually. And uh, I'm gonna just start by talking about why we're having this webinar. Um, the two main questions we're asking or want to answer is first, how do we study effectively in an online world? I saw someone already in the question asking, hey, I studied for 10 hours straight and I still failed the exam. And so that's definitely something about studying effectively. And hopefully some of the tips we talk about here will help answer that question. But also, so then how do we do this effectively? And the, what are the hacks that we can do? So the very first hack we have is to reduce our anxiety. And um, I teach public speaking. So trust me when I say that I deal with a lot of student anxiety. <laughs> so the first thing we wanna do is kind of get a sense of where you're at. So we'll have a poll up. If you are able to participate, that's great. Um, the poll question for those of you who are calling in on the phone or can't see the poll is how nervous are you about the fall semester? And I'm just gonna give folks a little time to answer this. Um, we'll give you another 15 or 20 seconds to answer. And while people are taking this poll, I just wanna share that where anxiety comes from. Um, anxiety comes from a lot of different places, but one of the main places it comes from is a lack of feeling of in control and a lack and, and a strong sense of uncertainty. Um, so it makes sense that people are feeling pretty nervous about this semester or in general because you don't have a lot of control about what's happening and there is a lot of uncertainty. So we're going to talk about what you can do um, if we have the poll results um, shown. I don't know if folks can see the polls. There we go. We're sharing the results now. So you can see that at least more than half of you are somewhat nervous about this semester, which makes a lot of sense. And some of you are panicking. Don't panic. Don't panic. Trust me, there are things you can do. Um, and the people who don't want to think about it, I'm all with you. The avoidance is often very tempting, but don't avoid. Let's find you some coping strategies. So hopefully Hopefully we can talk about what to do with these things. So um, let's talk about what anxiety comes from and how to reduce it. The first thing I want to share is that anxiety hurts learning. And if you didn't know that already, then I'm here to tell you that it does. So we want to limit anxiety. And there's a few ways to do this. The first thing I want you to do is to think about what is expected of you. And finding out what is expected will help reduce that uncertainty. 
right? Because you're like, okay, this is what I need to do. And so being really tunnel vision about when you are doing something for one class, don't spend a lot of time thinking about another class. Think about the expectations for that class, right? When you are um, doing mental prep for one thing, it's really important to limit thinking about this other thing at the same time. So, so whenever you can, try to do that. The other thing you should do is to know what to expect from your professors. Some of you are first time semesters people here and some of you are not, some of you are returning, um, but it's a brand new world, isn't it? Because we're all online. And one of the things to know is that every professor has different expectations. One professor may get really upset with students who eat or drink over Zoom, like just the innocuous act of drinking may make them upset because that's a ground rule for them. So you need to know what it is that you can expect from them and that'll help reduce your anxiety if and when they yell at you for, for drinking water over Zoom. Um, and one of the things you wanna think about is how you can also um, get into a routine. What one of the things that routines do, now I'm terrible at this myself, so I'm constantly reminding myself, but routines help minimize the busy mental chatter. You can relax a little bit because you're like, okay, this is what I'm going to do next. This is what I'm going to do next. And so fig figuring out routines that help you both physically prepare to sit in a chair. And, and even if you're in like a classroom space, because some of us are still in live spaces, maybe, you know, wearing our masks. Um, and in that case, you also still need to maintain that sense of physical attention. Um, and mentally, it's exhausting to often look at screen time. So we need to think about taking Break. Some of you asked in the questions you sent ahead of time, you know, what's the best time amount of time for studying? I say it's different for different people, but you want to give yourself between 20 to 40 minutes. Um, and if you're better at it, an hour, but you want to take little breaks and little breaks, set your timer so you know that you need to stop breaking at that point. Um, so at this point, I'd like to pass it over to Anya, who has some student perspective on, on how you can reduce your anxiety. All right, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. So as Kara mentioned, my semester is a little wacky this year. So the school I attend, UAB, is actually doing a mix of everything. So we're having fully in-person classes. We're having hybrid classes where you come into class half of the time and then do online half of the time. And we also have fully online classes. So I'm an economics major, and that's a pretty small department in my school. So whenever I was starting the semester, I panicked because I saw that my schedule had all of my classes in person. I was really nervous about that and I did not think that learning in a class with a mask and worrying about the virus would help me learn while I was there. So I requested accommodations to be a re remote student. Those got approved. So currently I am a remote student for in-person classes, meaning that the professors are teaching students in person, but I'm zooming in for the class, which means that I have to utilize all of these online studying hacks to help myself. So that was my first freak out. And then my second freak out was when I realized that I'm giving myself online work, right? So my schedule is now gonna look a lot different than it did whenever I was attending regular classes. So my biggest tip, as Professor B said, um, anxiety kind of comes from not being uncertain, not knowing what's happening, especially now in this world of uncertainty. We don't really know what any, what's happening. We don't know how classes are gonna go. Um, so one way to avoid that is to get it organized at the very beginning of the semester. What I like to do is go through my syllabus for every class whenever I first get them and put every single assignment, including readings, quizzes, tests, into my agenda. Doing that, I kind of see a layout of my weeks and see how much work I will have every single week. Then I go ahead and use a Google Calendar function, and I kind of use that as more of my schedule planner. So I don't necessarily put tests in there unless they're like on ProctorU and I need to book time for them. But I do use it for, um, you know, my classes, um, maybe work, and then that's also wherever I kind of maintain a good routine. And if I have time, I will schedule in study time, I'll schedule in working out to stay physically active while I'm at home. And that really helps me stay organized. I also never have to worry about missing an assignment just because I do have that layout right in front of me. And it kind of encourages me to maybe not take on as much during my busier weeks when I can look ahead and just say, wow, okay, this week, a lot of tests, I'm going to have to take that week to study and maybe not, you know, have this meeting or hang out with someone or do this or that. 
So I love how Anya, how you talked about how you incorporate calendars, because I think calendars are really important and agendas are really important anxiety reducers, especially if you're busy. One of the things that I just want to add that I think is important is you, you can use an on paper agenda if that works for you, but there's also online agendas. I use several and um, one of the things that I really like about the online versions is that you can set reminders. So for example, today I knew that I needed to be here, right? And so my phone, because I had an automatic reminder, reminded me two hours ahead of time because I knew, okay, that's when I need to leave the house to make sure that I'm ready to be somewhere. And so sometimes you can set reminders ahead of time and they can come straight to your phone. So if you're somebody who has your phone with you all the time, there's no excuse. And what's great is it can reduce your anxiety. You're not gonna forget because you have a tool that's gonna help you remem remember. Um, also, in, in, and exercise is something that can help reduce anxiety and meditation and yoga. So there are all sorts of techniques for reducing anxiety, but planning ahead is definitely, definitely a big one. So moving on to the next hack, um, our hack number two is to listen to audiobooks. So we have another poll, um, and this poll is basically getting a sense of where folks are in terms of if they have used audiobooks before. So um, the question is, have you ever listened to audiobook? And it's a yes or no answer. Um, and one of the things I will share is that somebody even asked um, in the questions that they sent into this um, webinar ahead of time was, how about audiobooks? Can I listen to my books online? Um, or can I listen to my books? And the answer is a definitive yes. You absolutely can. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the polling at this point. Um, and you can see that, yeah, more than half of you have actually used an audiobook before, which is great. It's a really great tool. And I'll tell you why I think it's so great. Um, I think it's so great because one of the things that audiobooks pro provide you is a good way to multitask when you are doing mindless activities. Let me emphasize on the mindless, right? You don't want to try to listen to your Spanish book while you're studying math. That's not a great idea because those are two different languages that are happening in your head at the same time. When I say mindless, I mean like doing the dishes, right? I mean like if you're driving somewhere, if you have a Bluetooth and you have a phone with a good, um, you know, data plan, you can actually listen to your books online. And it's a great way to kind of spread your day. So you turn those 24 hours into 36 if you're, if you're able to do that. Audiobooks are everywhere, okay? One of the things that um, audiobooks are provided in library editions, um, you can get audiobooks from publishers like Cengage has ReadSpeak built into MindTap. So every book in MindTap has a ReadSpeak function. So you can have it uh, listen to you. Um, Audible.com has a huge library of public um, published books and Scribd.com has a subscription service that I would recommend you check out. I think it's like eight or 10 bucks a month and they have both textbooks and non-textbooks there. I think somebody has raised their hand. Um, Melissa, if you are able to write in, your, in the chat, um, in your comments or in the Q&A, or if there's a Q&A from Melissa, um, Kara, do we have a, a moment we could do that? Yeah, we haven't, I don't think we have anything quite yet, um, but if she has a question, she can go ahead and, and put it in the Q&A or the chat. Right, okay, because yeah. we have two people who have raised their hands. Yeah, I think um, so go ahead and put it in the Q&A and chat and we will get to it in a little bit. Um, so turning it over to um, Anya, I'm sure you have some tips about audiobooks as well. Sure. So I'm pretty busy. I like to get involved in a lot of on-campus organizations and in the online world that's even more difficult. It kind of eats up a lot of your time. So there's a lot of times whenever I'm um, busy so I can't really sit down and read a book but I also want to feel productive that day and feel like I'm getting things done. So I love using audiobooks whenever I'm doing things like driving, cooking, cleaning my apartment, just something in the background where I can learn but also do the errands that I need to do for the day. And like I said, it does help me feel productive. It helps me continue to learn while I'm running errands. And it's especially effective on those busy days when I just don't have time to sit down. I can't really block off time to do that, but I still want to stay caught up and not fall behind on reading my textbook. The rest of you, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes these buttons need to be pressed three or four times. All right, so hack number three, get to know your professors. So here is another poll opportunity for you to participate. Um, the question is, have you ever gone to your professor's office hours? 
And um, I'll let you know that I often feel that not enough students go to office hours. So I'm really glad to see that so far, the polling is showing that a lot of you have, but really, are we all that surprised given the fact that you're all here taking the initiative to come to this webinar that says that you are progressive and active students who are looking to better your education. So that's great. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Uh, oops. Um, and one of the things I'm going to do is just talk about this, because if you've gone to your professor's office hours, you've taken the first step, right, which is that you want to get to know your professors. Um, somebody else, you know, mentioned in the Q&A that it's really hard, they, that their professor's teaching style doesn't work for them. Well, unless you're going to drop the class, you're going to need to make that work for you. So it's more important than ever that you reach out to your professor and you create a working relationship with them. One of the things that often happens is we put off conversations we don't need to have right now to later, but I'll tell you from a perspective of having been in the classroom for over 20 years, when a student comes to me ahead of time and says, listen, I have um, a situation at home. I'm going to have to have my phone with me. Um, it might ring and I'm going to have to step out. And then that happens, I'm so much more accommodating. Or if a student comes to me and says, I have a lot of anxiety about this particular assignment, um, and then they miss that day, and they come to me and say, I'm really sorry I missed the assignment, I have had a lot of anxiety about it, I'm so much more understanding. So you're really doing yourself a disservice if you don't reach out. So you wanna reach out early, reach out often, create those relationships with your professor that make when you do have stumbling blocks along the road, they recognize you and they're willing, more willing to help. Um, you should request a Zoom meeting. It's like office hours, only better because you don't have to get out of your house. Although I do recommend that you get dressed. Um, it does not set a good first impression if you're in your pajamas or shirtless for a professor's meeting, just an FYI. Um, but remember, you're not bothering them. It's their job to support you. And Zoom is, is one way to do that. Or going to their office hours if you're in person, you know, with a, with a mask and social distancing. Please make sure that you do that because you're doing it for yourself. Um, and you're really going to help build those relationships that are so critical for success. And also, if you think about it, how many of you have had classes where you suddenly are looking for a job and you need a letter of recommendation and now you know no professors that you have a relationship with? That's a really challenging situation. Don't put yourself in it. Um, so... Anya? So, um, like Professor B said, a lot of professors hold office hours at the beginning of a semester, but they also hold them throughout the semester. So, it, I would say, in my opinion, that it is best to go whenever classes start to kind of make that initial contact. But if you're nervous or you forgot about it or you, they already passed, don't worry about that. You can always set up office hours or just a meeting with your professor by emailing them and asking. And I'm sure they'll be more than open to meeting with you during their schedule. So, like I said, I like to join the office hours as early as possible possible personally because I like to introduce myself and discuss some of the expectations for class, especially this semester when I'm a remote student and I won't be seeing them face to face. It's really hard to connect with them and I feel that joining office hours and having virtual meetings with them does help me connect. I do have friends who are a little bit more shy and not comfortable just talking to a professor through a video call that they don't really know. So a lot of them like to email the professor and just introduce themselves, tell them what course they're in, tell them what you know they're majoring in, what they're interested in, just kind of to let the professor know who they are and to maybe remember them next time that they're thinking of them. Uh, the more your professor knows about you, I would say um, that could help you succeed in the future. So last semester, whenever things went online, I actually had to stay in a house with nine people. It was super loud all the time. It was very hard for me to find a place with no one walking in the background, with silence where I could really focus. So I had to reach out to my professors and let them know about um, this new place that I was staying at where I couldn't really get quiet time. And I asked if it would be okay for me to have my camera and my microphone off. They, of course, agreed. And that was an easy way for me to stay more successful and not distract other students in the class. And if I hadn't told them what was happening, they might have seen me turning my camera and my sound off as, you know, me being a slacker, me not really paying attention in class, and they wouldn't have known what was going on. So I definitely recommend connecting with your professors whenever you can and kind of letting them know about you. I've also found that Connecting with professors can help you in the future. Um, a lot of professors will kind of recommend any, you know, research opportunities, internships, jobs that they might hear of, if they know about your interests, if they know about your career goals. 
So if you're, uh, so I know someone asked in the Q&A what to talk about to a professor if you don't really know what to say, if you're just introducing yourself. Just talking about yourself is really great and asking about them, asking about their research. Professors love talking about their research. So if they're doing research, I'm sure they'll be happy to share with you. But just sharing anything that you're interested in would be a great start. You don't have to overthink it. Just um, introduce yourself. I love the example you gave Anya about the Zoom because that is something that comes up um, more often now for me as well. And I have definitely found that I'm much more receptive to the students who say to me, I had one student, for example, who works at the hospital. And when we went into COVID lockdown mode in March and April, she actually messaged me and said, listen, I'm going to join class, but I'm going to have my phone, you know, audio off and I'm going to have my screen off because I have to do it from the hospital from the break room. And I really appreciated her telling me that because I would have interpreted all that quiet and lack of screen time the entire, you know, less of six weeks of the semester as her lack of engagement. But because she gave me the tip and she gave me the heads up, that definitely changed my entire impression of what was happening with her. Um, Tim, I see that your hand is raised. We're actually taking questions in the chat, in the Q&A, actually in the Q&A, if you can go ahead and put it in the Q&A. Um, and we'll be answering those um, at the end um, if we're not already answering them now. So hack number three, or number four rather, is to work on your memory. Now. We could do an entire webinar just on building your memory. In fact, if you look at the questions in the Q&A, a lot of them are like, how do I do better at studying? How am I more effective? How do I use my time more effective? How do I pay attention? All of that relates to memory. A lot of it does anyway, because memory is what takes the information that we learn and we see right away and transfer it into a place where we can access it later. And in that way, memory is a skill that's very related to listening. So one of the reasons listening is so challenging for us is because we have a lot of information and overload in our society right now. And it's, it's also important for us to recognize that we learn differently in different situations. I know I saw someone in the Q&A that's like, I don't like audiobooks, they don't work for me. Well, if they don't work for you, don't use them, right? I mean, the tips here are for people, you can take the ones that work and dismiss the ones that don't. But regardless, if you are looking at things in a digital environment, we have to retrain our brains to relearn how to listen in digital environments. We are, um, if you're listening to this, you're most likely a digital native if you're a younger student. Um, and one of the things that happens in digital native the environments is, is that you look at digital environments as entertainment. Like we listen to the TV, we listen to videos, often for entertainment purposes. And so you have to remind your brain that you're not watching this video for class to entertain yourself, that you're not watching your professor give a, a, a talk over, over Zoom or whatever for entertainment. You're listening for comprehension and it's a different way of listening, not listening for enjoyment. So there's a couple of things you need to do to be good at that. The first thing is you can physically engage with your class content, okay? Um, and when I mean physically engage, I mean that there's research, brain science research that says that when you physically do things, you're more likely to remember. So it may sound hokey, but when you're studying, I recommend moving your hands. Like if you have three parts, Go ahead and be like, the top level is this, the second level is this, and the third level is this. Physically get into your studying and do things physically with your body, and it actually might improve your memory, believe it or not. It's a very interesting brain science thing. Um, the other thing, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, the other thing that I'm going backwards here, um, the last thing I want to share about um, working on your memory is that when you are um, listening, you need to learn how to focus. And that's a challenge. We are cognitively lazy, right? So give yourself a break, right? I mean, a lot of you are like, how do I focus? How do I focus? Think about giving yourself a break. And I know I've said this before, but it's really, really important. And that's one way to remind your memory. And when some of you asked about languages, languages learning is very cyclical. And what that means is it's better to study for 20 minutes at a time and then take a break and then come back and study another 20 minutes than it is to try to cram three hours all at once. So actually that's why the question earlier about, hey, I studied so much, that actually might be hurting your memory. So I uh, apologize for my um, PowerPoint failure just now, but I'm passing things on back to you, Anya. All right, so I also saw a lot of questions about y'all being worried about, you know, I'm studying for 10 hours at a time and I'm still not retaining the material. What's going on? How can I study more effectively? 
I have also been in that boat many times. I would go to the library, I would sit there for 10 hours, and I would just read over and over and over, and I just wouldn't comprehend the material that I was reading. So something that's really important, like Dr. B said, is reading for comprehension. So, and listening for comprehension. So how I do this during online classes is I have to take notes when a professor is talking. I like to have a PowerPoint or whatever they're working from pulled up. I have an iPad to take notes on because that helps me more. And I like to take notes about everything they're saying while I'm listening. And that helps me be more interactive in the lecture. So for example, if I come up with a question, I'm able to ask it then and there rather than waiting when I'm watching a recording later on or not paying attention in class and just rewatching it later on and wasting time. It also kind of helps me um, understand the concepts better, just being there in time and having the professor give examples instead of kind of worrying about it later and not listening while the lecture is live. I also like to get my brain ready for class about 15 to 30 minutes before it starts. So I have been one of those students who woke up five minutes before class, brushed my teeth, brushed my hair, and that was it. I was ready for class. But then I found that it was kind of harder to pay attention during class. I was a little foggy. I was just not in the mood for class. I was kind of ignoring what was happening and trying to wake up. So I like to do something um, interactive, stimulate, stimulate my brain. And whether, you know, reading a book, listening to an audio book, listening to a podcast, um, doing anything that you enjoy, even watching a YouTube video that you might enjoy, um, it'll really help you kind of wake up, be ready for class, put your brain in that learning mode, and then you don't have as much trouble focusing and kind of, you know, being bored while the professor's talking because you know what you're there to do. Yeah, and I love that you have such good self-knowledge, Anya, because one of the things that good memory really relies on is also knowing your own best biorhythms. Um, some of us are more night owls and some of us are more morning people. If you're a morning person, don't try to cram for your exam at 10 o'clock at night for the next morning because you're not going to remember that material as easily as if you heard about it or read about it in the morning. I know that I'm at my best in the evening. And so that's often when I do my, my most of my work that I want to have good memory recall. So there are definitely things you can do to learn to be better at studying and to better with memory. Um, and again, we could talk about that for the entire <laughs> webinar, but we have one more tip and that is hack number five to create your own online community. So um, I call this an account of buddy. So accountability buddy, account of buddy for short. Um, and you can create a community of account of buddies, right? Um, if you're feeling isolated and alone, trust me, there are lots of other people who are feeling the same. In fact, there are at least, you know, hundred, hundreds of people on this webinar or watching this webinar who feel the same way as you. And that's one of the reasons we're all here is because we're trying to create community and we're trying to learn together. So some colleges are providing studying um, remote environment platforms and they're creating situations where we can learn together in remote or social distance ways. So you should find out more. I would talk to your student life office and ask them because I bet that there's some platform or something that you could take advantage of. Um, I also recommend you take personal initiative and try creating your own small study groups with GroupMe or Sign Up Genius. Um, these are really great platforms um, that I use with my students, uh, encouraging them with Sign Up Genius. I use that as a way for people to sign up for assignments, but there's no reason why you couldn't also use this as a time for people to study up, sign up for, for study groups. So figuring out ways that you can have other people be in community will help keep you accountable and help make you feel connected and you're more likely to succeed. So personally, uh, whenever I'm starting a class, I'm a little bit more outgoing and I love making friends with anyone that's in my class. So in virtual classes, I don't have as much trouble reaching out to someone in my class, in my online course even, and you know, through Canvas, through Blackboard, asking for their email or their phone number and asking them to join a study group or um, just asking to connect with them in case you, know, you need any help from them. You wanna start a study group, you maybe miss some content and you want them to send you some notes. Um, but I know that some people aren't as comfortable doing this. So GroupMe is a great resource if you don't wanna ask someone directly for their phone number, you don't think they might be comfortable with that. By using GroupMe, you can just get someone to send you their email and you can communicate with them that way. But I think it's really important to kind of find your people in every class or at least one person that you can communicate with about the content. I like to organize virtual study groups and I use something called the when to meet. So basically anyone who's in your group um, is that picture on the left with the green squares 
um, anyone that's in your group can indicate when they're available. And then the most green section, I guess, is the section where everyone is available. So that's whenever you can schedule your session. And I also like to do the sessions through Zoom. I think it's really helpful because there's a lot of cool tools. You can share your screen. There's a whiteboard function. So if someone has an iPad or even if they want to write with their um, cursor, they can write things on a screen, work problems out together. Another helpful tip with study groups is to have a leader. I find it really helpful to kind of dictate a leader per study group, just because then they make sure that you're on task, you know, we're not kind of hanging out rather than studying and we're really dedicating the study time for studying together. So I just want to respond to one of the questions in the Q&A that says, are there any tips for older students? Um, I would say this is absolutely one, a very important tip for older students, because one of the things you can do, even if you're not necessarily all that comfortable in a virtual environment, this will help create that comfort because creating a connection with other students is really important. And let's say you're feeling a little shy and you're not as outgoing as Anya and you don't want to be the one to raise your hand and say, hey, let's create a community group or a study group. Um, that's where you can ask your professor and you can say, would you mind asking and letting people know that there's a student who wants to create a group group session and just sharing that website or sharing my email. Um, and then that way you're not actually the one making the announcement the professor is. And more times than not, I can't imagine a professor saying that they wouldn't do that. Because I think any professor would recognize that when you connect students, it makes them more successful. So I definitely think that's an important thing. So at this point, I'd like to turn things back over to Sengage. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor B. So we're going to get to some of your guys' questions because you guys have some amazing questions. We'll try to get to so many, as many as we possibly can. But just a reminder, you can use the Q&A feature or you can use chat. Um, I see Anya and Professor B in there already answering some questions, but we'll answer some live here um, as we have plenty of time to get to some, which is great. I did just want to talk really quickly about how Sungage is supporting you. Um, Lisa, Lisa, if you want to hit the next um, slide here. So a few of you have asked about um, different ebooks and different resources that are available. I did want to point out um, if you are using Cengage this semester or you've purchased Cengage Unlimited, which is our subscription service, there are a lot of additional resources in here, just even outside of just your actual ebook um, or online course, you know, homework. Um, there is a, a navigation bar on the left you see in the picture, and there's one that says college success tips. There's a ton of videos and modules in here to kind of help you with some of these issues that we covered today and other really great topics. So you can see there's self-care, challenges of online learning, um, help with study tools. So definitely if you have, if you have Cengage Unlimited, um, definitely take a look at some of these, these videos and modules as they can be really, really helpful in this big shift um, to an online environment. Um, and then the other thing I did want to point out too, on the next slide too, um, a lot of people have been asking for the PowerPoints from this. We are going to send you an email um, in the coming days. And in that email, we will have a link to the recording. So this has been recorded and you can watch this as many times as you want. Um, it's on demand for you, so you can absolutely come back and go ahead and go through this again. Um, we will also, in, in that, link to our Cengage page as well. So if you have any questions about um, the Cengage products you're using or support, you absolutely can visit our Cengage.com slash student site, and we will provide more information on that site for all things related to our courseware, but also about this webinar. And then the last little plug I wanted to do really quickly, um, we have a great Instagram account called Cengage Student. That is the, um, the handle for Instagram for our account. Uh, there's a lot of really fantastic tips. Uh, this is where we broadcast about upcoming webinars, different things that we're doing, helpful hit, uh, tips and tricks. So definitely follow along on Instagram um, for some additional uh, you know, information coming from us. But we're really hoping that um, you know, from We'll hear from you guys in the email that we're giving you. We have a survey that we will also send out. We would love your feedback. It's really, really important to us that these are helpful um, and useful webinars. And so any, any tips that you guys have on how we can better support you guys is really, really appreciated. So, um, so now that we've done all the housekeeping stuff, 
we let's get to some of the questions because there are quite a bit coming through and I know Anya and Professor B might be answering some of these. So if you've already answered them, just feel free to, to let me know. Um, but there's a couple of things that have come in. Um, one question is, um, let's see here. How do we retrain your brain for learning instead of entertainment? Like, do you have any examples, Professor B, on how to do that? Yes. Um, so one, the, so like we need to recognize like what does our, when we are listening, uh, what you need to prep yourself before you listen to say to yourself, I'm listening for content now. Right. And so then in the very first parts of it, if you're listening for content, um, what do you do to listen for content? Well, Anya mentioned she takes notes. So taking notes is one way that your brain gets taught, oh, I'm listening for content now. I mean, how many of us listen to our best, you know, our, our favorite musical artists taking notes about, you know, oh, I really liked the way that they transitioned from their first phrase to the second. Maybe if you're in a music class, but if you're not, you tend to be, so listening for entertainment is often a more passive activity. Um, it may be active, but it's active in a different way than, than your mind. So you need to think of like, what are the accompanying activities that you do to kind of create more of a retraining of your brain. That's great. Um, another one that's come up a few times before the webinar, and then I've seen this in the chat as well too. Um, what do you think, Professor B, about flashcards? And then Anya too, would love your opinion on if you use them and if they're helpful. Um, Professor B, do you recommend this um, or is just reading the material, you know, you know, we talked about notes, like it is our yeah. flashcards helpful? I think it is for certain subjects. Like I think that if you're in the sciences or you're studying terminology, I definitely think flashcards are helpful. Um, and the, the kind of rote memorization that needs to happen, that can definitely be helpful. Um, I don't know, Anya, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. The only thing I would caution against is using flashcards for classes where you need to learn the content and it's not just vocabulary, just because a lot of times I have done, I have made the mistake of kind of memorizing like the fill in the blank answers rather than actually understanding what the content means. So I definitely agree if it's a vocabulary based or anything like that. Flashcards are really important. I like to use Quizlet personally, but if it's something, a content that you really need to kind of absorb and um, understand yourself, I wouldn't necessarily recommend flashcards for that. Great. Someone just asked about groups and ideal size of study groups. Um, I typed the answer, but I'm also just going to share it because I just found this out that there's been research that shows that groups are ideal when they're four, four people. So four to six really should be what you're aiming for in a study group. Anything more than that, it's not as productive. That's great. And we've seen a couple um, come in around kind of the same topic. And it's just really about balancing a full-time job and being a full-time student. I think there's a lot of stress around that. Professor B, anything that, yeah. that you want to talk about around that? Sure. So I'm a very busy person. And one of the things that I have learned is that don't try, don't you set yourself up for failure. Don't try to accomplish too much in a day. Um, we can really only accomplish like 10 tasks in a day. I know that sounds really pitiful, but it's true. And so what you need to do is figure out and prioritize what are the things that you absolutely need to get done and how are you gonna get those things done, right? Um, and also wherever you can kind of double dip in a way, like if you have um, a speech class that is asking you to come up with an informative speech, if you're in a phlebotomy class, right? Ask your professor, now it's really important to be above board on this. Go to your professor and say, I'm taking this phlebotomy class. Is it okay if I give my speech on, you know, how, to, how, how people draw blood or what are some of the, you know, major, you know, blood diseases we need to watch out for or something like that as my informative speech because you're writing a paper about it in another class. Then they may be completely okay with that. Most of the time they would be because they're completely different modalities. You giving a speech is different from writing. So thinking about things like that, you know, I'm not saying do what my, one of my classmates in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade did, which is to write every major paper and speech about the White Sox controversy for every class. This is not what I'm saying, <laughs> but I'm saying, you know, use your time wisely and figure out how you can multitask those kinds of opportunities. And, and really don't try to do too much because it's not going to happen. And then notice what are the places you're wasting time and re recognize how to cut those back. I know for me, I spend way too much time on Twitter. And so I've learned that I'm just going to have a Twitter free day on those days that I don't have other things to do, that I have other things to do. That's great. Um, Anya, I've got a couple questions for you. 
Can you give an example of what an online study group has looked like for you? Like are people asking each other questions or what is the setup kind of once you get on a, a group, um, you know, session? Sure, so this can look different for really um, any class that you take just because classes are part of studying. Um, I have done it before tests as like a pre-test study group and then usually if we have a study guide or something like that, we would go through that and talk about it together. But in other scenarios where you're just studying to be caught up with the material, uh, usually it is kind of a format of asking each other questions. I like to go through my notes chapter by chapter and just review everything with everyone. So even if everyone is kind of solid on something, I'll bring up the topic, discuss it really fast, and then, you know, if we all give a thumbs up that we're good with it, we'll move on to the next topic. Um, it is also helpful if students come prepared with some questions they might have for each other. That's why the leader of a study group is pretty important, just to make sure that, um, you know, everyone's getting their questions answered, you're not moving too fast. But I would definitely say um, that's how my study sessions have been in the past. But really, you can make it as formal or as casual as you want to. This is really like your environment to have with your peers and your classes. So whatever you think is going to work best for you in every class is what I would recommend doing. And then I know someone asked for like the time of a study session. So like Professor B, I don't have the scientific research, but um, I say after like an hour, an hour and a half, your brain kind of shuts off and you're just kind of done talking and discussing content with your friends or your peers in your class. So for me, the ideal one is about an hour. Yeah, it depends on um, your age, actually. Young children can't focus for more than 20 minutes. Um, and, you know, middle school age, it's like 45 minutes. By the time we're an adult, it's, it's stretched to about an hour to an hour and 20 minutes. But it really depends on the person is also true. So yeah, I would say an, an hour is a really good rule of thumb. That's great. Another question that, that came in, um, Anya, I don't know if you want to take a stab at this one as well too, but um, there's a lot of different platforms, a lot of different ways that, that instructors are teaching. So different systems being used, different ways to, to have a test or do homework. How do you keep it straight? If you've got, you know, four different, you know, instructors and they all do different things, how do you keep it straight for how you do different things in each of the classes? Well, I think that's a great question for Anya. <laughs> yeah, okay, Anya, you go for it. <laughs> okay, so I also have, especially this semester, it's crazy. I have a professor using pretty much every textbook platform, which means I had to buy textbooks and subscriptions to every single textbook platform, and it has been unfortunate this semester. But I kind of combat that by, like I said, whenever I go into my agenda and set everything up, I go through each of those websites and I put literally every single homework assignment I have. And it does take like an hour or two whenever I'm sitting down and doing that initial task, but that saves me so much time and anxiety later on. So I will go through every single website that I know a professor is using and see any assignment they have, any homework. And I'll even schedule in readings. So for example, this semester, I have three classes where my whole grade is just three tests. I don't necessarily have homework that I can put in my agenda, but I like to space out the chapter reading based on the syllabus to tell myself like before this class, I have to read this chapter so that I'm not falling behind and getting lost. So that's usually how I do it. Great, great advice. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of advice on how to cope with other instructors' foibles. <laughs> <laughs> And Professor B, do you have any tips on motivating yourself when you're working at home? So a lot of people are, are struggling with, you know, being yeah. at home during this time. You've got to buy, get buy-in from your, from your peers at home. Like if you're living, whoever your people are that you're living with, like I teach a night class, okay? And I teach a night class on Tuesday nights. And my husband was set up a little sign that was like, caution, master at work. <laughs> he put up a sign right in the, the area of the dining room where I was doing my Zoom class. And then they all went into the living room and didn't bother me for three hours and made sure, you know, that nobody was playing drums or, you know, I, and I tried to accommodate them by saying, you know, when I took a short break, I got out and said, okay, I'm taking a short break. We're taking 15 minute break. So if you want to play drums, now's your chance. And then I'm like, all right, I'm going back in. So you really got to get buy-in from people at home. They have to recognize. And so you aren't necessarily teaching a class, but you're maybe taking a class and you could say to everyone, listen, I just really need quiet for the next hour. Could you guys just go walk around the block or could you, you know, go in the other room and watch something quietly while I'm trying to get this work done? Because if you don't ask for help, they don't know that you need it. So that would really be one of my biggest pieces of advice. And then also finding that place where you really can be productive. You know, don't set up 
right next to the refrigerator if you're someone who tends to get up and eat lots of snacks. Don't sit in the, in the living room if you're likely to get distracted and want to turn on the TV. So think about where you are most productive and create a learning environment in that place for you. That's really, really important. Um, my daughter's in online school right now. She's 11 and she has decided that the, the white counter in the kitchen is where she's going to do all of her work. And so every, every night we clear it off and that's where she does her work. And it's, it works pretty well because there's really nothing to look at there other than a big picture. And she gets a lot of work done there. That's fantastic. So yeah, so I think that is most of the questions that have come in. You guys um, have really given us a lot of good questions. One more just, just came in here. Do you recommend going to a nearby library um, to do work or you know, is there another place that you recommend if you can't focus at home? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, for people have different needs. Like some people do really well listening to music while they study. Other people can't listen to music while they study. So I think it, in some cases, this is a little bit of trial and error. Um, I don't know if, if your library is available. I know that our local library is open for half an hour appointments. And so you know that if you're in there, it's going to be quiet and, and, and effective. So yeah, if that works for you, I definitely recommend it. But be honest with yourself. Like check in after you've done whatever strategy you've tried. And if it didn't work, say, okay, that didn't work. I won't do that again. Uh, so that would be my advice. That's great. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today on this webinar. Like I mentioned earlier, we will send out an email with the recording to this webinar. Um, and of course, there's also a survey in there. So if you have any feedback, uh, if you want to see more of these, please do let us know as we want to be here as a resource for you guys. But we wish you guys the best of luck this semester. And thank you so much for spending the time with us today. And thank you, Professor B and Anya, for, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Good thank luck, you so everyone. much. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.